So I guess the, the title of my talk is The Tree in Treehouse and the theme of my thinking about being here today and in my presentation later on is that when we say the word treehouse, I would say it tree house. The house comes afterwards. The tree is the important part. When we look at pictures of tree houses, we're, you know, rightly so enamored by the tree house, but it's the tree that is really at the root of it all. And I like to say I've been hanging around trees since I was a little kid, and uh, my love for going up in height uh, took me into a, a long stint in my life as a rock climber. I climbed quite extensively around the world. I've had the sort of good fortune of taking some of my passions in life and streaming it into a career. So I was able to exercise my climbing skills and focus on aspects of keeping trees there. Because of my passion for working with old trees and conserving trees, one thing which came up really early on was risk assessment of trees. You know, it says urban forest, and I know that a lot of tree houses get built not right in an urban center, but this area here that we're in right now is, for all intents and purposes, from a tree perspective, an urban forest. It's an interaction between people and trees. And the people have the opportunity to do the best things for trees or to be their worst enemies. So we have all these types of benefits that we manage trees for um, and that we think about from trees uh, that aren't timber or firewood or the sort of traditional silvicultural goals of managing trees. So air quality, microclimate, property value, storm water, energy conservation, noise reduction. And then in the end, I get down to here, wildlife habitat, something that's really important to me. And I think one that everybody around here can relate to is trees contribute to our physical and psychological well-being. So, you know, if you're feeling blue at the end of a hard day, if you can get to a forested area and go for a walk, you're going to feel yourself calm down and feel better. And I have the etc. because everybody here will have their own reasons why trees are important. We have this graph where we've got leaf area or benefits on this axis and, and tree size slash age. And the point of this slide is that if, if we had only all these small trees around us, we wouldn't get very many of those benefits which I just spoke about. But as trees get larger and develop these large canopies, they become exponentially more valuable in all of those types of benefits to us. So one of the reasons that I got into uh, risk management and conservation is that in many areas, these trees are the ones that are disappearing, the ones that give the most benefits. A heritage tree or a heritage plant, uh, we got this description uh, put together by a professor at the, at the University of Toronto. And I'll just quickly read through it. It's an outstanding specimen due to size, form, and shape. It could be a distinctive community landmark. It could be associ associated with a historic person, a place, an event, or period. It could be a representative of a crop grown by our ancestors. Uh, a specimen recognized by members of community as deserving heritage recognition. So it doesn't have to be the biggest, the best, the oldest. And trees almost define some sort of a sense of place. So this is an example of a cultural heritage tree. This is a tree called the Dancing Linden from Schassenbrunn in Germany. And Dancing Lindens were um, quite common in Europe and I think especially in Germany. The idea of the design was that this platform up here is where the townspeople would dance while the band played below them here. Some of these trees are hundreds of years old. So here you can see the tree out of leaf and you can see a lot of um, what are called pollarding cuts. By maintaining this tree over time, here it is in, in almost present day, it's smaller than it was originally. But when we were doing some research about this tree, we found this slide on the internet and it's a painting from about 200 years ago. And in the center of it, the centerpiece of the painting, is the dancing linden. So this is a tree that's been contributing to people's lives in a cultural way for hundreds of years, and it's still there today. We've, you know, these are types of examples where we've learned about uh, managing trees uh, and, and maybe managing them in different ways than nature would, but managing them in a way that we can retain them for long periods of time. Um, this is another tree from Germany. It's called the Holy Adigna. It's a tilia tree. And these trees are uh, species of trees that have a propensity or an ability to live for long periods of time. So this tree is called the Holy Adigna. Adigna was th uh, the daughter of one of the kings of France, born into a life of opulence. But she chose instead to work as a nun. 
and she worked in this small community. And in the written history, she was described as the hermit nun. And between the years of 1075 and 1109, she lived in a small shack and the hollow at the base of this tree. So this tree is well over a thousand years old. Um, you know, and, and so again, a tree that, um, and you can see that it's been managed, parts have been cut out. Part of the idea of these types of management techniques is to keep the tr trees relatively small so they don't break themselves apart. Another example, this is a, a tree that I got to visit when I was in Great Britain, and Great Britain is home to uh, literally, you know, the largest collection of old and ancient trees anywhere in the world, as far as I know, and this is something like an 800 to 1,000 year old oak, and these are just dotted on the landscape everywhere in Britain. Uh, and just again, show us, you know, how long these trees can go. Coming a little closer to home, this is a live oak in Savannah, Georgia, and you can Hopefully you can sort of see people underneath it here to give you a scale. Uh, and this one had a nice story in that there was a development site here and they were going to take, you know, like modern development, nuke the whole site and then build houses. Uh, Savannah said, no way you're going to cut down this tree and restricted him. And so he, he built the, built the um, subdivision with a road leading right up to that tree and then a circle around it. And we got a chance to speak to him that day and he told us that basically um, he ended up making more money on this site by saving this tree and losing two building lots, but being able to charge more for all the people who had a view onto this tree and who lived in this community. And then, you know, the giant redwoods, um, you know, Scott mentioned that uh, we, we, we had an opportunity uh, to, to go together to some of the biggest trees in the world. And uh, we went with um, the preeminent researcher, Steve Sillett, and we wanted to see whether some of our methods of sonic tomography would work on big trees and he took us to the biggest tree in the whole forest. Uh, we ended up climbing this tree to uh, 347 feet up into the sky. So that's an example of an outstanding specimen uh, that's lived, they estimate that tree is around 2,000 years old. And there's the base of the tree uh, to give you an idea about the scale of it. I think at the, at the base across the bottom at ground level, the tree was something like 28 or 29 feet across. There's, I guess the, where, where some of these slides come from is a talk that I give that's entitled Conservation Arboriculture. And out of a recognition of the fact that there are these trees on the landscape that can grow to these really old ages, how can we, what can we do to better manage these old trees, especially some of these trees that were managed for a long time but had been left to their own devices. And just a few points about it, it seeks to really look at, at, at taking an ecosystem approach to looking at the tree. Um, it's a multidisciplinary science. One of the really strong tenets with old trees is that trees are habitat. They're homes for a whole bunch of interdependent species. And those species have co-evolved um, with trees over time, over evolutionary time. And most things that are working with trees are tree associates. Even the fungi that uh, as arborists were trained many times, we see a, a bracket on a tree and we say, oh, that's a problem. But in many, many cases, it's not a problem. It's an associate of the tree starting to break down the old wooden material and not really having a negative effect. The last point is to optimize the health of trees, you need um, to look above and below ground. And I'll reiterate again that we tend to look at trees and we see them up there. And that's obvious because that's what we can see. But we've got to remember that what keeps those trees alive is the root systems of the trees that are under the ground. And anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of the biomass of the living material of a tree is underground. So if we see this big old tree standing beside us. You've got to imagine that somewhere around here, underneath it, there's almost as much wood in its root system underground as there is above ground. And, and you know, if there's only one message that I can give all of you today, that's protect the roots of your trees. We are all focusing on going up and installing, etc. But we've got to protect the roots of the trees. We can't forget that.